In this episode of Richard Doesn't Understand How to Overclock a Processor, I'm going to describe how I wasted quite a bit of my last weekend trying to eke out a bit more performance out of my new Ryzen 5 3600, mostly through using the Precision Boost Overdrive functionality on the processor. During my testing, I used a combination of Prime95 and Furmark in order to stress test the system. These two stress the GPU and CPU independently. And so here I have both running along with Ryzen Master and Wattman from AMD, displaying my relatively stable thermals and uh, clock speed. From the abuse testing, I was able to draw the conclusions that one, my power supply unit is up to the task of delivering the power here. I even overclocked my GPU on some of the testing to 150%. Um, there's a power slider in Wattman that allows you to scroll up the power limit. And data, this does improve the performance. I boosted my 3D Mark scores on TimeSpy significantly. However, uh, in normal operation, I just leave this alone because you have to adjust this every time you start Windows if you want this to take effect. In addition to the power supply being sufficient, it also is stress testing the motherboard's ability to deliver power. Since I bought a relatively budget motherboard, this was in question. Over all my testing, I haven't seen any instability. During my testing, I primarily used Ryzen Master for my overclocking. I did a little bit of tweaks in Wattman, but the focus today, or last weekend, was on my CPU. And so I went through and I tried to leverage this functionality using specifically Precision Boost Overdrive. I used the auto overclocking. I never touched manual. I figured that AMD's engineers are better at overclocking or just de like building a processor than I am, some random guy on the internet. So Ryzen Master gives a very good representation of how the Precision Boost Overdrive is working. Um, for those unfamiliar, PBO or Precision Boost Overdrive was released with the 2000 series processors, specifically the Threadripper variants. And then with the 3000 series, it's available on all of the mainstream processors. I don't know if it's available also on the um, APUs. But for our case, 3600 has the feature. And the PBO is allows you to hit the limits on three variables. One variable is temperature. And so this is clearly represented with this dial. When I originally started testing with a stock cooling, I would peg 95 degrees very quickly. Um, in addition on temperature, there's some discussion online about how even though 95 is the limit, um, AMD starts throttling the processor much lower. Originally, the high temperature limit was 80 degrees and it backed off to 75 and I haven't been able to find an official post from AMD. This is all threads. But it, the moral of the story is that in order to keep your clock speed high in or, and avoid throttling down, you want to keep the temperature as low as possible. So my CPU cooling fan ramps up to 100%. I believe it's at 65 degrees C. The next item in the PBO triangle is the VRM limit, and this is actually the number of amps that the motherboard can deliver. This is represented by the thermal design current and electrical design current. They're over on these two dials. So TDC is the max amps when the CPU is thermally limited, and it's inherently lower than EDC EDC is the total capacity of the socket with no thermal uh, limits. I don't know the exact relationship between them, but clearly in the dials, we have a lower TDC and we're just never going to deal with EDC. They're effectively a very similar functionality. And we're right up at 90% of the socket right now. And this is slightly higher than stock settings. Stock settings, um, I know it's 65 watts. And last is the platform power threshold. And this is the total capacity in watts of the socket. This sounds very similar to the amps of the socket, 
however voltage comes into play. Since I'm using automatic for all my settings, there's really no need to get into the nuances of it. During my testing, watching these dials really helps identify where the issue is and what you can do to improve your speeds. So when I was doing the stock configuration, temperature was a major issue, especially when I was running temperature abuse tests through Prime 95. Now I'm hitting power delivery. And while there are mechanisms to cheat on power delivery and crank it up, um, I was never able to get a successful run. Not due to instability, I just never had a benefit in the scores that I was generating um, using TimeSpy to rate if the actual increase in clock speed translated into a better score. All right, so let's crack open the case and take a look at my pre-existing situation for cooling. Um, this case did not originally come with this vent on the side. I added this to blow air directly onto my GPU, which typically is the hottest part. I have a 140 millimeter water cooler. And so it's a Corsair, I think it's H90. Um, originally when I bought it, I wanted to have the radiator up top. However, I realized very quickly that there's not enough clearance for both the radiator, which will fit in, but then a fan would interfere with the motherboard. On my previous Intel setup, I 3D printed this shroud so that I could add two 80 millimeter fans, but it's kind of defeating the whole point of having a big radiator. So now I have to give some consideration to the airflow in the case. If I'm going to have a radiator down here, that will be generating heat. So even though it could be an air intake, it's not necessarily cool air. Um, I will also have an air intake right here from the front panel of my case. So I'm tempted to overpressurize this region. I think the amount of heat generated from the CPU won't neg negatively um, impact the GPU's ability to cool itself. And we'll have the one fan pulling in from above. Um, that will also have, and then we'll keep this fan up here as exhaust. So we'll have a positive pressure here that will um, then exhaust up here. I would, I think I still will make a fan shroud up here when I have uh, another opportunity because I would like to have air blowing directly onto um, this region of the motherboard. One of the issues with water cooling is that without the CPU fan spinning, um, components in this region, the uh, VRMs, are, may overheat because they're originally they're designed for the CPU fan to blow air across. Even if it's warm air, it's still air movement, similar with the memory modules. So I think that will work well. So here's a comparison of a handful of tests. I was using TimeSpy in order to benchmark. The reason I was using TimeSpy, even though it is game oriented, it is relatively fast as long as I only ran the CPU test. That's about 30 seconds. And it also gives one easy to read score. It's not perfect because of its short duration. You're not really stressing 
the thermals of your heat dissipation system. However, by combining it with Prime95 to stress test, I think this is acceptable. This table is presented backwards with right being the oldest and the newest being on the left. So on the right hand side, I initially started off using Ryzen Master auto overclocking and I was hoping to get an improvement, but ultimately I actually got a terrible score, um, less than 6,000 on the CPU score. Um, during that testing, I was also verifying the power delivery, so that's why those tests, the GPU is set to 150%. Both Wattman and Ryzen Master reset when Windows reboots. It is designed to stop you from going to a unsustainable setting and then being locked out of Windows, which is good, but it also means that every time you restart the computer, it, you have to re-enable it, so that's why the testing on the left-hand side does not have the GPU to 150%. After failing miserably with the auto-overclocking, I messed around with PBO, and I mucked about with that. It, this does not capture all the test cases that I did. Once I realized that I was not getting the results I wanted, I was stumbling around looking for something past, around 6900. Also with the stock cooling, I tested the creator profile that is built into Ryzen Master, hoping that the default settings would be helpful. I did opt to go to liquid cooling, which was always something that I planned on doing. I was hoping that liquid cooling would really enable PBO to take it up to the next level. On the right-hand side, PBO is stuck at 95 degrees C, and then on the left-hand side, it's almost the exact same score, but cooling is no longer a major consideration there. To round out my story, I was getting incredibly frustrated with all this work. And since both Ryzen Master and Wattman require to re-enable every time I start Windows, I thought I would go with relatively conservative settings, all automatic, in the BIOS, and then just never worry about it again and report in this video that overclocking is a waste of time. Which it largely was a waste of time. These are not huge jumps. But those automatic BIOS numbers did provide the best scores that I had or out of all my testing. And one thing that I neglected to really pay attention to in my testing, I think is the reason why I was unable to get good results, is I largely ignored my memory. And on hindsight, that sounds relatively obvious. Um, in Ryzen Master, I was using automatic settings for the memory. I mean, the whole idea of this work experiment was to see how good the automatic what automatic overclocking was. The thing that I think really kicked it for me is that XMP is enabled definitely on the best case scenario. I went in the mother BIOS and I enabled it. I thought it was enabled in other testing conditions. However, Ryzen Master might override it and the this is where I'm suspecting there's issues with the memory timing on the other conditions. So if I wanted to do a more exhaustive testing and demonstrate that Ryzen Master isn't garbage, I think it's a good product. It's, I still use it to monitor temperatures. I would need to understand better memory timing. This provides some comparison of where my computer skits compared to global time spy results. Um, the upper plot is CPU scores, and then the lower is overall score. I have searched by CPU, GPU, and two-channel memory, so these should be specific to my configuration. While my scores are not being records, I have been beating the average. Um, there is still room to improve, but in my opinion, the automatic PBO and XMP settings are easy enough that they're approachable for anyone, and to gain the remainder of these scores, manual overclock is more work than I'm willing to put in. Looking at the BIOS, specifically, I'm running a BIOS version that would be a mouthful to read. Uh, it was released in September. How I enabled overclocking, I did not go through the overclocking settings. I actually went through advanced and then the AMD overclocking. I don't know what the difference is between the two menus. Um, they contain effectively the same options. And in here, I went through and just left everything, either switched to automatic or left it alone. For example, nothing, nothing is happening on um, the manual overclocking. For 
DDR frequency timings, I left these all with the factory options. Uh, the MSI was good at reading what the clock speed is of my memory. I also have XMP enabled up here, which will affect the memory speed. Um, DRAM power options are as auto and enabled. I am not familiar with CAD bus configuration or data bus configuration. These are all buttons that you could press. Um, Infinity Fabric, I have a slight idea what it is, but still set to auto. Eco mode is set to off. That would reduce the amount of power available to your CPU. Precision Boost Overdrive, set to auto. If you enable this, you can actually set your limits higher by hand. However, I am happy with what I've been getting out of automatic. Um, I'm not sure why that's set to uh, 1100. I think that's how the BIOS came. I'm also not familiar with the Uncore mode, but this is all of the uh, non-CPU, like Northbridge type functionality. Um, auto again for voltage control and auto again for voltage, or er, manual, what a surprise. If I haven't lost your confidence yet, I hope I've lost your confidence now. I clearly don't know what I'm talking about. Moral of the story, there's a lot of automatic buttons in the BIOS, and I think they're not a bad idea. Or you could spend a day mucking about and get a little bit faster performance. Good luck!